Okay, from now on, whenever I talk about an aerobic exercise, which is a long duration or a low intensity, it's an endurance exercise, I'm going to be talking about running, long distance running. And whenever I talk about anaerobic exercise or high intensity exercise, I'll talk about sprinting because I'm a runner and because those activities are very easy to talk about, running long distance and sprinting. So in this video, we're just going to talk about with, uh, so we went over how glucose enters a cell, breaks down to pyruvates, and pyruvate can either go to lactic acid or it can go to the electron transport chain. I mean, the cell's mitochondria, they go into the Krebs cycle, and then the electron transport chain, which is also in the cell's mitochondria. Talked about going to lactic acid is anaerobic respiration, and going into the Krebs cycle is aerobic respiration. Krebs cycle. Remember, glycolysis or the process of glucose going to pyruvate, going to lactic acid, is called glycolysis. That happens in the cell cytosol. Now, this whole process, I don't know if I went over in previous videos. I'm not going to watch the videos to see if I covered it. But from going through from glucose to pyruvate, it's there's many steps that I skipped. It's about ten, nine different steps, nine and ten steps, depending on how you look at it. Now. You actually lose some. You actually use some ATP, and that's the process. For, so we use some ATP to get to pyruvate, but we also make some ATP. So if you want to break down the steps, we lose two ATP in uh, two certain steps, and then if we keep continuing, we gain four ATP in uh, another two steps in the glycolysis and steps in here that we skipped. Don't worry about the steps. This whole process means the act of glycolysis gets you a net of two ATP. Now that's the two ATP that I was talking about when you form lactic acid. Or when you go through glycolysis or anaerobic respiration, you form a net of two ATP because the, acts, the process of going from glucose to pyruvate forms two ATP. Not a lot of ATP, but it's something. It gives you energy extremely fast. And we say when the reason why we go from pyruvate to lactic is really to regenerate that NAD takes that NADH, pyruvate turns that NADH back into NAD, and thus we regenerate the NAD. And this is important because we, to continue this cycle, we need NAD. One, one uh, step uses NAD and turns it to NADH. And you actually get two NADHs, which is important to know these numbers because at the Krebs cycle, we're going to calculate everything. So we get two NADHs. <clears throat> and the reason we form lactic acid is, is to regenerate this guy so we can keep the cycle going. And as a side effect, we build up lactic acid and as lactic acid builds up, it increases the acidity in the cell or in the muscles and acidity is not good and muscles do not like acidity and we die. Or not really, but we stop exercising. Now say we go to the other process, we're, do, we're, running a, we're running a marathon, we have a long duration, low intensity. So we go to aerobic respiration, so we go to the Krebs cycle. So. So remember all these numbers that I'm erasing it. <clears throat> so what happens is we have pyruvate. Now pyruvate goes into the cell's mitochondria. Crosses the mitochondria. So now it's not in the cell cytosol anymore. Now it's in one of the organelles. The mitochondria is the main powerhouse of the cell. This is where all the ATP is made. The mitochondria. Always relate mitochondria to the powerhouse of the cell. Goes into the mitochondria. Once in the mitochondria, it forms. So I'll just abbreviate pyruvate as pi, whatever. It forms something called acetyl-CoA. You don't have to worry about the enzyme that makes it form acetyl-CoA, but it forms acetyl-CoA. That's the next step inside the cell's mitochondria membrane. And when it forms acetyl-CoA, it also gives off an NADH. And remember, since there's two pyruvates, you get two NADHs because everything's happening twice now. And then acetyl-CoA enters a long cycle, confusing cycle with many different substrates that you don't need to know. It's not metabolism, but it enters a cycle. And this cycle gives off, and one step it gives off one NADH, it gives off another NADH and another step, and another step gives off another NADH. Again, you, do not, you don't need to know the steps that give off these NADHs. <clears throat> it also gives off, one step also gives off something called FADH. And another step gives off something called G, GTP. Don't need to know the steps, but really you're just focusing on what you're forming in the numbers. So one cycle gives off three NADH, one FADH, and one GTP. 
Don't worry about what the hell GTP is. So you got all these things. Now remember you have two pyruvates, so thus you had two acetylcholate, so the cycle happens twice. So you really get six NADH, two FADH, and two GTPs. So the reason why these are important is because the next the next cycle is called the electron transport chain. Don't you know a lot about the electron transport chain? But all the electron transport chain does is it takes electrons, thus its name. It takes electrons, which electrons are also H's. These are electrons, kind of. It takes these electrons off of these uh, carriers. These are carriers, NADH and FADH. It takes the electrons, takes the energy from the electrons, and converts it into, well, it, it converts the energy so you can form ATP from ADP and phosphate. So at the very end of the electron transport chain, you have all this ADP floating, you have a phosphate, and all these electrons give it enough energy so you can form ATP. And you also have water and oxygen, which is why this is the same oxygen we breathe. That's why if you hold your breath and you don't have oxygen, you can't do this cycle and you can't make ATP and you die. Remember, you always make ATP. ATP is used for everything in the body. If you can't make ATP, you're dead. So, <clears throat> now these numbers are important because every NADH is equal to 3 ATP. So we'll say 3 ATP. Every FADH is 2. Every GTP is 1 because the GTP is essentially an ATP. Now the book might say 2.5 or 1.5, but that's getting more into detail on like biochemistry and whatnot. Just go by 3 and 2. NADHs give 3. FADHs give 2. Now simply do the math. You have 6 NADHs, so that's 18. ATP. You have uh, <clears throat> four of these guys and one of the, oh, these guys. Yeah, that's not right. But, okay, what am I missing again? Okay, so we'll start from the beginning. <laughs> so you have six, each Krebs cycle, for each cycle of the Krebs forms three NADH, one FADH, and one GTP. 3 NADH is equal to 9 ATP, 1 FADH is equal to 2 ATP, 1 GTP is equal to 1 ATP. Add these up, 9 to whatever, it's 12 ATP. So one cycle of the Krebs, or one Krebs cycle, one cycle round gives you 12 ATP. You have two cycles, so you times it by 2 and you get 24 ATP. Was my math right in that? I don't know. But you get 24 ATP. Okay, so so you have 24 ATP. Now, if remember that I said the whole process of aerobic respiration gives you 38 ATP. So you're probably wondering where do the other ones come from. Well, if you remember the process of going from pyruvate, before you even start the cycle, from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA gave you one NADH, that whole process. Now you have two pyruvates, <clears throat> so this process happens twice. So this, you get two NADHs from this. So you add them, that's six, it's six ATP. So that will equal 30 ATP. Have to remember the, this, this process. This will give you 30 ATP. Now, <clears throat> going back to the beginning, so we have 30 ATP. Now, if you remember from glycolysis, I'm going from glucose to pyruvate, which started the whole cycle, which is glycolysis, gave you two NADHs from that one process and also gave you two ATPs. <clears throat> so add those up. So now you have 32 ATP because you're adding the two ATPs you formed and then you have these guys <clears throat> and then that's six. So you have 38 ATP. Now you will see some differences if now this is if you use glucose, free glucose that you just ate. Now if you use glycogen, muscle glycogen, Remember, glycogen is a storage form of glucose, so you already have all this glucose stored up on reserve. So, and glycogen is already inside the muscle, so one, uh, one uh, path step that we skipped was when glucose goes into the cell, glucose has to be phosphorylated because it can easily leave the cell, just how it came into the cell. So in order to stop it from leaving the cell, it gets phosphorylated, and that process... That process takes one ATP just getting into the cell. Now in blood glycogen, blood glycogen's case, blood glycogen's already inside the cell, so it doesn't have to be phosphorylated. 
this all this means is instead of forming two ATP, you form three ATP, you form one more ATP with blood glycogen, and thus you will form 39 ATP if you use blood glycogen. Remember that. 39 ATP if you use glycogen, not blood glycogen, muscle glycogen. If you use glycogen, you get 39 ATP. Now you might also see 36 ATP. That's with the shuttle systems. I don't know if I talked about it, but the shuttle systems are just a way to bring these guys into the cell's mitochondria. Remember, this happens in the in the cell cytosol. NADH can't get into the cell's mitochondria where electron channel chain is happening. So to get NADH into the cell's mitochondria, you have these shuttle systems. I won't go into too much detail, but essentially they bring the NADH into the cell's mitochondria. And the way they work is they take this H, bring it. Okay, don't know what I'm drawing anymore. It takes that hydrogen, because remember, the hydrogen is really what you care about, it's the electrons. It takes the hydrogen, brings it into the cell's mitochondria. <clears throat> One shuttle system shuttles it to an FAD, that's seen in. The FAD becomes an FADH. Remember, FADH only gives you two ATP. You do the math, that gives you less ATP all. Another shuttle system brings it in, transfers it to an NAD, and the NAD becomes an NADH. So that's two ways you can regenerate NAD in case you ask this. But that's the shell systems. I don't know how much detail should go into the shell systems. So that's the two exercises. You have endurance exercise, and you can you can. There's many ways you can call it. You call it endurance, uh, slow, light intensity. These are all words used to describe aerobic respiration. Which aerobic respiration? In the next video, I talk about beta oxidation and the process of burning fat. Aerobic respiration usually burns fat, but it can go, but glucose can go through aerobic respiration, go through the Krebs cycle, and all that good stuff. Now, high intensity exercise, high intensity, which is it's in the eye, but high intensity, which is mostly run, sprinting and whatnot, goes through glycolysis. And also the other process that we talked about, what is that? Yeah, the other process that we talked about, which was the ATP PCR system which it really just classify the exercise by the intensity, whether it's running or, endure, or running a marathon, which is aerobic respiration, it's long, it's slow, it's, the intensity is not too great, you don't need the energy right away, or running 800 meters, you need the energy fast, it's up to three minutes, or something like jumping, throwing a baseball, gymnastics, high jump, whatever. Something that's extremely explosive, you need energy right away, you would wanna use the ATP PCR system, and then glycolysis and then like blood glycogen is glycolysis and blood glycogen is if the uh, activity is up to three minutes so now these videos answered everything on glycolysis breaking down of energy the next video is on beta oxidation and then we're done with energy i would never talk about energy anymore in this first exam